Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us uh, for uh, today's event on the U.S. arms transfer policy. Um, we're very excited to have Ambassador Tina Cadenow with us to uh, give us some remarks on that and a really stellar panel uh, after that. Um, and I'm going to begin, as we always do, with our obligatory security announcement, uh, because we have thought through what to do in the case of an emergency. Uh, I want to let you know that we have, a, we have plans, and if something were to happen, I'll be your security uh, guide and let you know where to go, either out the way you came in or out the back, depending on what kind of an emergency might arise, but we don't expect that today. Um, I also want to thank uh, the sponsors who make these events at CSIS possible, uh, including our general member support, which has a big role to do with today's event, uh, and also a, a sponsor, Lockheed Martin, who helped us uh, make it possible to do today's event. And uh, I want to thank uh, our friends at the State Department very much for, for supporting us and um, being able to talk about this topic. Uh, and I think it's very timely. Obviously, change is afoot in the world of U.S. arms transfers. Uh, you're seeing dramatic growth in the level, of the dollar value of U.S. arms exports, um, and also changes in the world market. So the, the focus of where exports are going is shifting as, as demand around the world uh, changes. Uh, we're also seeing that our arms uh, exports uh, and security cooperation more generally are a major focus of the strategy, both in the national security strategy uh, and the national defense strategy. Uh, and no doubt related to that, uh, there's a huge leadership focus on it. It's something that we see the President of the United States personally engaging in and addressing on a regular basis. Uh, it's something that has been a focus for the Secretary of Defense, and so it has a leadership focus that is uh, pretty unparalleled in the last year and a half. Uh, so there's been a major new policy announced uh, at the start of the year, uh, updating the, the previous uh, conventional arms transfer policy. Uh, and then we are just now on the tail end of the uh, implementation review for how to make that policy practical in the way that the arms transfer process actually operates. Uh, and I hope we'll hear about that uh, um, in the remarks coming up. So without any further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ambassador Cadenow. And uh, after she's done, we'll bring the panel up and have the discussion. So the floor is yours. Great, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for the very kind introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you this morning. It's a very good crowd for an August, my god. Um, and I love being introduced by sort of an emergency announcement. I, I promise I won't cause the emergency. Uh, at least I hope not, uh, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. And it's, um, it really is a pleasure and it's a privilege to be here today to talk about some of the issues that we are talking about because arguably, as, as Andrew pointed out, this is really front and center, uh, both in terms of the president's agenda, but also, uh, frankly, in terms of our work in the State Department and more broadly throughout the, the U.S. government. Um, so it is timely and it is something that I think is worthy of, of longer discussion. I will apologize to you because after these remarks, I'm I am called off to a meeting at the White House, but uh, my colleague, Laura Cressy, who is standing right here in front of me, or sitting, um, she will be part of the panel. So we, the State Department will be represented together with some other uh, folks that you've got, very illustrious folks that you've got, both from uh, the government as well as from industry. So uh, with no further ado, let me just say, I think, again, as Andrew mentioned, and I know that most of you are aware, in April of this past year, the President issued a National Security Policy Memorandum announcing a revised conventional arms transfer, or as we like to call it affectionately, a CAT policy. The CAT policy provides a framework under which the U.S. government and all of its agencies will review and evaluate proposed arms transfers. The new policy reflects the priorities of the President's national security strategy, which are, namely, to preserve peace through strength by reforming regulations to facilitate the exports of U.S. military equipment, to strengthen partners and allies, to facilitate U.S. economic security and innovation, we'll talk a little bit more about that, and to uphold respect for human rights and U.S. nonproliferation objectives. In short, the new CAT policy was designed to expand opportunities for American industry, create American jobs, and maintain U.S. national security, ensuring that we continue to review each arms transfer thoroughly in order to ensure that it is in the national interest of the United States. 
The release of the new policy was only the first step in a series of what we believe will be very practical, results-focused initiatives to transform the way that the U.S. government works to support and grow our defense industrial base. Through that memorandum, the President also directed the Secretary of State, in coordination with the Secretaries of Defense, Commerce, and Energy, to submit an implementation plan within 60 days. So during the 60 days following the release of the policy, my colleagues from across the executive branch and I met with stakeholders from industry, from civil society, as well as congressional staffers to collect all of their input and hopefully closely align our implementation plan with real world challenges. In fact, as part of this engagement in April, I met with a group of scholars from the NGO and think tank community right here at CSIS to discuss the new CAT policy. We're very grateful for everybody who contributed feedback to that very important process. And subsequently, as directed by the President's National Security Policy Memorandum, we did indeed submit a national implementation plan on July 13th. The plan represents an integrated strategy, one that aligns our conventional arms transfers with our national security and economic interests, and it's built on three specific lines of effort. First, the plan calls for prioritizing strategic and economic competition through a paradigm shift from the current reactive posture to a more proactive posture that actively develops partnerships and capabilities reflective of U.S. strategic and economic objectives. We will use this policy tool to ensure that U.S. products can win in the competitive global marketplace. Second, the plan envisions organizing our efforts for success, ensuring that the executive branch is positioned, staffed, and resourced to best support efficient execution of the conventional arms transfer policy, and that its processes are also similarly constructed. Third, the plan calls for creating conducive environments through engagement with Congress, industry, international partners, and other stakeholders to foster the efficient operation of U.S. defense trade. What all this really ultimately means, and what the initiative makes clear, is that under this administration, there will be no more active advocate for U.S. sales than the U.S. government itself. Thus, a top priority of my bureau, the Bureau of Political Military Affairs at the State Department, is maintaining the United States as the security partner of choice for our many friends and allies overseas. As just one example of this effort, not even a month ago really, I attended the Farnborough Air Show in the UK, where I met with defense industry representatives from US companies of all sizes to discuss the CAT policy implementation plan and to seek feedback in real time. And let me say, uh, again, those companies were both small and medium as well as large, so we tried to hit on the array of companies that were represented there, all of which were, were present. I also met with counterparts from strategic partners and allies, uh, some from Europe, other parts of the world, to brief them on the President's new policy and to advocate strongly for ongoing and prospective defense sales. For years, U.S. embassies and consulates have been committed to supporting U.S. companies' efforts to grow their global exports. Our diplomats have long worked to ensure that U.S. products and services have the best possible chance to compete abroad. Through participation in key forums like Farnborough, the administration's defense trade focused initiatives build upon this tradition of economic diplomacy and direct the U.S. government to support America's defense industry by strengthening our advocacy for defense sales that are obviously so critical to our national interest. The State Department, through my bureau, has played a central role in the development of the CAT policy and its implementation plan because arms transfers are and must be tools of our overall foreign policy objectives. Through the responsible oversight of arms transfers, we're supporting existing allies and partners, or in some cases, establishing and expanding new security partnerships that we hope will last for generations. The complexities of our operating environment are clearly manifest. The issues we tackle every day at state are at the confluence of policy, regulatory, economic, and congressional imperatives. As we endeavor to faithfully implement the conventional arms transfer policy, we are anchoring our arms transfers in, as I said, our larger foreign policy framework, 
and simultaneously protecting the security and the integrity of our technological advantage and our de defense industrial base. In terms of that larger policy framework, let me speak for a moment about two important global issues that we take into account on every arms sale, human rights and proliferation or non-proliferation. In terms of human rights, the CAT policy requires that every sale be assessed for the risk that it may contribute to a gross violation of human rights. This reflects an immutable American value. So let me repeat myself, we will not provide arms where we believe they will be used to conduct a gross violation of human rights. For sure, there can be complexities in any sale. For instance, not, of all, not all of our partners are as discriminating as we ourselves are when it comes to the conduct of their military operations. For that reason, the new CAT policy requires us to work proactively with partners to reduce civilian casualties in their military operations. We also regularly use sales as an opportunity to engage with partners to address the human rights conduct of their military. These are often imperfect situations, but we also always work to reduce the chance of the misuse of US arms. The same simply cannot be said for most other suppliers of military equipment around the world. In, in terms of proliferation, we also work to strike a balance between providing our partners with the capabilities they need to defend themselves and ensure regional stability while limiting the proliferation of new military technologies and creating regional imbalances that can lead to an arms race. In doing so, we work within the context of the multilateral regimes to which the US is a party. That does not mean that some of these regimes do not need sometimes up updating. For example, the Missile Technology Control Regime, so-called MTCR, designed to prevent the proliferation of missiles never took into account the role that unmanned aerial systems now play in both the military and commercial realms. In reviewing each sale on a case-by-case -case basis, we must ensure that we are not accelerating the spread of advanced weaponry and creating opportunities for our competitors, economic and strategic, to expand the space for their own defense trade to our ultimate military and economic detriment. It's also the case that we care deeply about creating US prosperity. In fiscal year 2017, the State Department authorized, licensed, and provided oversight for $41.9 billion worth of government-to-government -government sales and $112 billion in direct commercial sales. These sales help support over 2.4 million people across our nation who work in America's defense industry. We're expending every effort to maintain America's status as the preeminent global exporter of defense goods. By specifically recognizing the link between economic security and national security, among other changes, the new CAT policy provides us the tools to continue this important work. That said, while some aspects of the arms transfer process will change under the new CAT policy, the State Department will continue to carefully evaluate each potential sale or export. In addition to the non-proliferation considerations and the human rights concerns that I discussed earlier, we will continue to weigh a number of other important factors, including the appropriateness of each transfer in responding to legitimate US and recipient country security needs, the effect on US capabilities and its technological advantage, and the degree to which the transfer supports US strategic, foreign policy, and defense interests through increased access and influence, allied burden sharing, and importantly, interoperability. We will also continue to lead another key part of the arms transfer process, the administration's engagement with members of Congress, which is coordinated by the State Department. We're communicating with our colleagues from the House Foreign Affairs and the Senate Foreign Relations Committees on an almost daily basis as part of the congressional notification process, which is required by law for arms transfers that meet certain thresholds. I want to emphasize the fact that we take our role in the regulation of arms transfers exceptionally seriously. This is why we have worked closely with the White House to help drive the new CAT policy forward, understanding that we must always evolve our policies and our processes to meet the challenges of today, but also to prepare ourselves for what is over the horizon. 
As I mentioned earlier, these steps are among the first in what we hope will be a series of efforts to streamline the arms transfer process. I can assure you that my colleagues and I at the State Department, but also again more broadly in the USG, will continue exploring ways to cut red tape and give US industry every advantage in an increasingly competitive global marketplace while continuing to ensure the responsible export of arms. In conclusion, I do want to underline the fact that each delivery of US defense articles and services sends a message to our friends and to our foes. It's an act of support for and trust in our partners and our allies. It provides them the necessary capabilities to defend themselves, to support the security and stability of their region, and when necessary, to participate in US-led joint operations. I think we all can attest here that American companies produce the most technologically sophisticated and effective defense systems anywhere in the world. The CAD policy and its national implementation plan are vital first steps in a series of government-wide initiatives to strengthen our allies, to support our national defense industrial base, and to drive American job creation and innovation. The State Department will continue to be a leader in these efforts into the future of that, I can assure you. So with that, I know that today's panel discussion will constitute a very fruitful dialogue, and as I said, I think a timely one. Uh, I really want to thank you for your attention, and again, for the great attendance here today. That's, I think, very encouraging. And uh, we will do everything, as I said, from the State Department uh, to drive this agenda forward, which is um, obviously an important one from the administration's perspective. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Cadenow, and I, I have to apologize because it completely slipped my mind to introduce you before your remarks, so uh, my apologies, but thank you so much for those comments, uh, and that will, I think, set a great foundation for our panel discussion. Uh, having neglected to do it earlier, I don't know that it makes that much sense to introduce her now that she's departed, but uh, for those who, who have tuned in, uh, and aren't completely familiar with Ambassador Cadenow's position. She is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Political and Military Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, and uh, therefore has had the leadership role on this conventional arms transfer policy that was rolled out uh, in the spring. And fortunately, she has left with us her uh, able uh, colleague, uh, Laura Cressy, uh, who uh, can speak to this and I understand played a, a, a prime role in that process as well. Um, so I am, in fact, going to introduce the panelists uh, for our discussion, and then uh, we're going to kind of uh, take our discussion in two parts. We have the luxury of, uh, of about a 90-minute uh, time frame to do our panel discussion, so we're going to kind of divvy it up into two main sections. Um, the first focused uh, primarily on the policy changes that are underway and how they are going to be implemented and their likely impacts, and the second um, then maybe broadening out and looking at the strategic context for the policy changes uh, and, and how uh, it's going to play in that strategic context. So uh, let me begin by introducing the panel. To my left is Laura Cressy, who is the Deputy Director in the Office of Regional Security and Arms Transfers in the Bureau of Political and Military Affairs. She works for Ambassador Cade now. She's responsible for overseeing worldwide foreign military sales, uh, transfers of excess defense articles, and third-party transfers, and she's had a distinguished career in the State Department, uh, as well as uh, a career in private sector. Uh, so she's one of those, um, uh, I, I shouldn't say rare, but one of those uh, wonderful people who has brought private sector experience and government uh, experience together. To her left is Alex Gray, uh, who is a Special Assistant to the President for the Defense Industrial Base and Deputy Director of the White House Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy. Um, he previously served on the presidential transition team uh, for the U.S. Department of State and uh, as a senior advisor to uh, U.S. Representative Randy Forbes, uh, Virginia, 
who was a senior member of the Armed Services Committee and someone that I worked uh, with and for when I was on the House Armed Services Committee staff. So, uh, Alex, great to see you again. Great to have you with us. And um, we appreciate also that the, the White House saw fit to bring its, uh, a voice, its voice to this session today. Uh, to Alex's left is Keith Webster, who is president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's uh, Defense and Aerospace Export Council. Uh, he's responsible for guiding the development of the Defense and Aerospace Export Council's efforts to strengthen U.S. defense and aerospace exports, uh, including advocacy and analytical work on behalf of council members um, and, their, uh, and their work putting their positions in front of government, Congress, the broader business community. Uh, before joining the chamber, uh, Keith was the Director of International Cooperation at the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, where we were actually colleagues uh, in the uh, Once Upon a Time Office of uh, Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Um, uh, and his office is, has survived, good, good news. His old office has survived the transition uh, as part of the um, Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, as I understand the new organization. Uh, prior to that, he was the uh, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army uh, for, uh, for these kinds of export issues. So deep, deeply knowledgeable about this uh, in his government service and also now in his private sector capacity. To his left is Melissa Dalton, who is Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of CSIS's International Security Program uh, and Director of CSIS's Cooperative Defense Project. Now, her research uh, focuses on reinforcing the principled foundations of United States defense policy and military operations. Uh, she conducts um, research and writes on security cooperation with allies and partners in U.S. defense policy in the Middle East. Uh, and prior to joining CSIS in 2014, uh, she served in the Department of Defense in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy uh, and was a, a senior advisor for force planning for the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review. To her left is Jeff Abramson, who uh, in uh, about a year ago rejoined the Arms Control Association as a non-resident senior fellow for arms control and conventional arms transfers. Uh, he also manages the Landmine and Cluster Munition Monitor uh, and uh, organizes the Forum on Arms Trade. And prior to doing these duties, he served as a policy advisor and director to the Secretariat of Control Arms. Um, and is also the former deputy director of the Arms Control Association and former managing editor of the publication Arms Control Today. And to his left is uh, Dak Hardwick, who is Assistant Vice President International Affairs at the Aerospace Industries Association. Uh, his primary responsibilities include international defense, space trade, and export control issues. Uh, and he oversees AIA's role in bilateral and multilateral trade relationships in key regions. Uh, trade advocacy initiatives and international cooperative programs. Before joining AIA, DAC was at the Harris Corporation, where he's responsible working with the U.S. government and international officials to ensure timely export of Harris's uh, products for U.S. allied and partner nations. And he began his career at the headquarters Marine Corps as an appropriations budget analyst. So, uh, everyone, thank you for joining us. As I mentioned, we're going to kind of divide the discussion a little bit. So we have some opening comments, then some, some interactive discussion, then another set of opening comments, some interaction discussion, and then we'll have interactive discussion with you, the audience, with your questions. Uh, so we want to make this as interactive as, as we can. Um, and so uh, I would like to kind of start with a focus on the, the policy itself, the implementation review, how we think it's going to operate, what we think the impacts will be, and I'm going to kick it off. Uh, Laura, with you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for your kind introduction. Um, to you and uh, Melissa for hosting us. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you here today, look out and see some familiar faces. Um, I'm looking forward to a, um, a lively discussion. Um, I'm also very excited to be um, on a panel which set, which, with such uh, distinguished colleagues. Um, so looking forward to our talks today. Um, today's actually uh, the latest in our continuing efforts to engage uh, stakeholders in arms transfer policy discussions. Um, we value these discussions, as Ambassador Kate now uh, mentioned in her comments, um, and we value the input that we have received uh, from industry, from associations, uh, think tanks, and we'll continue to solicit feedback um, as we move forward in um, in uh, our implementation plan and trying to look at the processes and policies that we have in place uh, in the arms transfer realm. 
Ambassador Kate now outlined how our new um, CAT policy and the national implementation plan for that policy both reflect the President's uh, national security strategies and the national defense strategy. She also discussed how the CAT policy is designed to expand opportunities for American industry, create American jobs, and maintain U.S. national security. So what I want to do in, in these couple minutes is to delve a little bit deeper into the implementation plan and what that plan uh, contains and try to um, explain those a little bit more in depth, those three lines of effort that she mentioned. Um, and to remind you, those, uh, those three lines of effort um, are prioritizing strategic competition, organizing for success, and creating conducive environments. So the implementation plan uh, that we were tasked with putting together um, in the CAT policy is, um, is a, uh, an effort by us to really carry out uh, the President's vision. Um, it is an effort to better align our conventional arms transfers with our national security and our national economic interests. So under this first line of effort, the prioritizing strategic competition, we're, taking, we're trying to take a more proactive approach to arms transfers. Specifically, we're trying to improve our ability to compete with our adversaries by providing our partners with viable alternatives to foreign products uh, in order to maintain influence in key regions throughout the world. We're going to be working with our partners and allies to identify critical capability requirements that they have and then trying to expedite transfers uh, to support these essential foreign policy and national security objectives. The second line of effort, the organizing for success line of effort, is actually really taking a, a close look at how we are organized within the executive branch and how, how we are doing our day-to-day -day work um, and what we need to do to focus on to make sure that we are best positioned to facilitate um, transfers that meet um, our national security objectives. For example, we're going to continue to update the policies and regulations that provide us the framework for our arms transfer decisions. Specifically, we'll look at streamlining the International Traffic in Arms Regulations, or ITAR, um, and also continuing to revise the U.S. Munitions List and the Commerce Control List. Um, We'll also be looking at the day-to-day -day processes um, to ensure that we are as efficient, as streamlined, and as effective as, po as possible. So some of the things that we're looking at um, and that uh, folks in industry and associations have asked us to look at is establishing milestones and timelines for the foreign military sales process, improving and speeding up our contracting process processes within the Defense Department, trying to increase the competitiveness, competitiveness of U.S. defense items and systems by building in exportability to the design and development, and also by expanding support for what we call non-program of record systems. We're looking into potential financing options that could make our systems more attainable for some of our foreign partners. And we're also examining existing policies to ensure that they don't unnecessarily detract from our ability to compete in, international, in the international marketplace. Um, finally, one of the other things that we're looking very closely at is, uh, is our advocacy process to make sure that we are the most effective advocates for uh, U.S. Uh, industry. The third line of effort, creating conducive environments, is aimed at addressing things that are, that are outside the uh, executive branch, outside of our purview and control. And so what that means, for example, is working with um, the State Department's committees of jurisdiction to address any legislative fixes that could increase efficiencies in the system, also working with uh, the, other, uh, the other committees, too, uh, with the, the DOD committees to see if there are any fixes that, uh, that might, might help as well. Working with our partners, uh, our international partners, to try to help better define their requirements and their needs so that that can help speed up the processes. Um, addressing overly burdensome policies that create barriers for U.S. entry such as uh, overly restrictive offset policies of our foreign partners. Um, and also working with industry to try to, uh, to increase production capacity in order to uh, decrease the lead times for U.S. defense items. 
In sum, what we're trying to do in this, in this whole of government effort, looking at the arms transfer process really from soup to nuts, is trying to um, ensure that once we have decided that a transfer um, of a defense capability to a partner is in the national security interests of the United States, that we are able to effectively compete and efficiently deliver the equipment to our partner um, as quickly as possible. I'll close by underlining the fact that while some of the aspects of arms transfer processes um, will change under the new CAT policy, as Ambassador Caden now said, the State Department will continue to evaluate each uh, arms transfer um, or potential sale on a case-by-case -case basis. We will also continue to work very closely with our committees of jurisdiction on the Hill to make sure to help them carry out their oversight responsibilities. The CAP policy provides a framework under which U.S. arms transfers, whether they are commercially licensed sales or government-to-government -government transfers, will be reviewed. It does not change existing laws and regulations um, regarding the export of U.S. defense items. Um, the other thing I wanted to add is while the, the CAP policy really is quite uh, important for us, this is, this is the fifth iteration of the CAP policy. The first CAP policy was signed by President Jimmy Carter. Um, for us, I think the really exciting thing is this implementation plan, which, uh, which really musters all of the efforts of the U.S. government to try to harness um, the uh, forward movement and forward momentum that we do have to try to make the processes as efficient um, and as effective as possible. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alex. Thank you. Alex. Thanks so much uh, to Andrew and his team and CSIS for, for having me here. Um, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to be here with my interagency colleagues, Laura and Ambassador Cade now and, and the State Department. Um, we've got a great collaboration on CAT throughout the interagency, DOD, the White House, State Department. And I particularly want to acknowledge our colleagues at the National Security Council who led this effort, who have just been tireless and incredibly skilled at, at pushing, this, uh, pushing this through. Um, you know, I'm here on behalf of the White House Trade Manufacturing Policy Office, and our mission is to work with our interagency colleagues and with the National Security Council to promote policies that expand balanced trading opportunities abroad encourage policies that uh, buy American and hire American, and protect and strengthen the U.S. defense industrial base. Uh, the conventional arms transfer policy encapsulates all of those objectives. Uh, rather than, you know, Laura and State have, have done such a great job articulating the implementation side of this, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how CAT fits into the administration and the President's broader agenda and uh, some of the um, some of the connections and connectivity between different aspects of that agenda. Uh, CAT was designed in response to a shifting strategic landscape that's increasingly characterized by great power competition across the political, economic, and military spheres. CAT prioritizes staying ahead of this competition by responding proactively instead of reactively to the defense needs of allies and partners. It also recognizes one of this president's signature themes, economic security is national security. By removing some of the previous administration's artificial barriers to the transfer of arms to critical partners, uh, the UAS export policy being one example, this administration is both strengthening our hand in the ongoing strategic competition while also stimulating economic growth uh, at home as well as job creation. It should be noted that the U.S. aerospace and defense industries contribute almost $1 trillion annually to the U.S. economy, and they support about 2.5 million American jobs. Uh, just as one point, the international uh, UAS export market alone is estimated to be worth more than $50 billion a year within the next decade. Those are the stakes we're competing for. Key objectives of CAT uh, going forward, and Laura outlined most of these working closely with allies and partners to identify the capability requirements they have and undertaking a whole of government response to meet those needs. Uh, particularly, uh, one of the things that our office has been very much involved in with NSC and state is the advocacy piece of this and ensuring that the competitiveness of our defense exports abroad for both economic and security uh, purposes is maintained. I would note, as Ambassador Cade now did, that the administration dispatched uh, one of the highest level delegations to date to the Farnborough Air Show several months ago, uh, which I think demonstrates just how committed the whole of government approach is to that, that particular aspect. 
Uh, we're working with partners to ensure that U.S. barriers to entry are reduced and that policies like offset requirements do not threaten American jobs or reduce our technological edge. And like Laura said, uh, continuing to update the policy and regulatory frameworks that underlie the arms transfer policy, including revising outdated policies and updating regulatory frameworks like ITAR. The CAP policy is part of a larger administration effort to stress the connectivity of economic and national security. That um, another being the assessment of the defense and manufacturing industrial base that was mandated by executive order 13806, uh, which we're hoping will be released in the near future. Defense exports are an important tool for maintaining a healthy and resilient defense industrial base, including one capable of surging in a crisis. A diversified defense export sector also supports a wide variety of critical labor skills that are required by the U.S. defense industrial base as well as our allies and partners. I look forward to continuing to participate in this interagency process as implementation of CAT progresses. And uh, we look forward to continuing this dialogue with all the relevant stakeholders here, whether industry or NGOs, and we want that dialogue to be frank, honest, and ongoing. I would particularly urge U.S. industry to engage with the interagency in this process by offering specific, quantifiable steps that will help meet the goals laid out in CAT. Again, I want to thank all my interagency colleagues and the uh, NSC, of course, for their hard work and dedication. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Keith. Uh, Andrew, thank you, and uh, thank you to CSIS for this opportunity to speak. And um, first of all, I'd like to put in context the uh, Defense and Aerospace Export Council, which was recently launched a few months ago in April at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's a unique opportunity capitalizing on the administration's interest in moving forward with cap policy changes to put forward a brand new council of the chamber that's focused on influencing the government, both the U.S. government and foreign governments and working with our industrial sector to advance opportunities for our industries uh, globally. And it's an honor for me to be part of that initiative and my executive director, Ben Schwartz, is here in the front row as well. Uh, as Andrew kindly pointed out, I have a little bit of experience, um, uh, roughly 33 years of experience in this very issue of arms transfer and cooperative research and development work with uh, friends and allies globally. And what has changed in that 33 years is that the United States and its industries, although having an incredibly capable military equipment, is not the only game in town. You're seeing the emergence of the Chinese and their uh, uh, military industrial complex uh, we're also seeing Russia uh, continue to advance some of its capabilities in the global market, as well as others, friends and allies, who have created military industrial complexes. So when I started in this business 33 years ago, we had a very strong corner on the market for advanced military capability. That is no longer the case today, so there is a paradigm shift. Specific to the CAT changes, uh, we at this council, at the chamber, are welcoming of the economic impact considerations as an element of the arms transfer review process. In my 33 years, it's the first time that the policy has been expanded to include this consideration, economic impact. Uh, it is not an overarching consideration, but it is allowed now to be a credible uh, uh, component of consideration and transfers. We also encourage consideration of foreign availability as an element of the arms transfer, uh, transfer review process, as we are witnessing China, as an example, not alone, but China, filling voids the U.S. left with a denial to a friend or ally. The consequence of a denial filled by China or others is as follows. The U.S. loses market share that is not easily recaptured and in some cases will never be recaptured. The U.S. loses control of the capability the U.S. loses the opportunity to train, influence, and maintain a military relationship with foreign forces who now are introducing into their inventory a Chinese, Korean, Israeli, etc., capability. And finally, with the introduction of, let's say, a Chinese or Russian system into the military inventory of that friend or ally, we now have a far more complicated future arms transfer decision process that is now compounded by 
a prior U.S. denial, and in some instances, we complicate the potential for expanded diplomatic relations. Let me explain how, what I mean here. India, let's take India as, as an example. I've worked very closely with India over the recent years for Dr. Carter. Years ago, we denied AESA radar for the Merca jet competition, fighter competition, several years ago, and the French clinched the deal. Now, I like the French, don't get me wrong, um, but I like American industry better. Uh, now, several years later, and I worked this initiative with Dr. Carter, where Johnny come lately to the effort for additional uh, aircraft capability in India, and now we're all in. We've revised our policies, IESA's possible, uh, co-production, production of aircraft, and make it India is possible, but we are behind now because the French beat us out. Another example with India, we never answered India's request for ballistic missile defense capability. That ask of the U.S. went unanswered for a number of years. And now India has been forced to consider and has made potentially, will buy potentially the Russian S-400 system, similar to what Turkey's buying, or has said they were going to buy. Uh, now we are rushing to put together a proposal for BMD for India to counter that situation. And why is that a problem for us? We have legislation on the Hill in 2017, CATSA, which penalizes friends and allies who lean towards Russian equipment specifically. Fortunately, there's been a congressional carve out for India, but it created a lot of anxiety. So, NDAA 2019, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2019 is headed to the President and we at the Chamber and on this Council, Defense Aerospace Export Council, are encouraged with the language in Section 1752 that reinforces economic consideration in this review process and also requires as well the consideration of foreign availability, a recommendation that we published in 30 proposals to the administration on June 8th. So we're excited about the language in NDAA 2019. Finally, the DAEC, this council, is working closely with the administration and the Congress specific to our 30 recommendations that we published on June 8th. We are encouraging the administration to use the tools it has to effect real change, to issue executive orders, directives, and to hold the system accountable to seize this opportunity to address issues that we have debated since the Defense News article wrapped in red tape that was published in 1997. I remember that many of you probably do not. A unique opportunity for true change, and I am honored to work with the colleagues here, represented both state, the NSC, and the White House, and others, to advance these changes. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. And as I mentioned, I'm going to sort of uh, take a break now on, on opening remarks and, and ask some questions as a moderator uh, that I would like the whole panel to weigh in on if they would like to. And um, I want to start with the question, if I could just pose it in its most general form and then elaborate a little bit about how you implement a policy in a process that is a case-by-case -case review process. Um, because these cases come up as individual transactions or deals. They, they may not be single transactions. They may involve multiple transactions, but they're reviewed, um, well, if we're lucky, they're reviewed as, a, <laughs> as an overarching case. And, uh, and so any individual situation has its own unique you know, bumps and hurdles and roadblocks, and that can lead to an outcome which may seem inconsistent at first blush with the policy statements that are being made. Um, so I guess that's in terms of how you implement this policy approach, and I really take to heart the kind of paradigm shift that was referenced by several about being proactive rather than reactive, and I, I, I strongly resonate with Keith's remarks that, you know, we previously we had a situation where U.S products were so much in demand, so, uh, um, so much the pinnacle that the world was seeking that, you know, reactive probably worked at least for a while because you had what everyone wanted and you could afford to be in a reactive mode. That I tend to think has changed. So how do we actually do a proactive process on something where it's case by case and we're trying to balance all these competing priorities? And I welcome anyone on the panel who has, has thoughts on that. I'll take a first shot and uh, 
So I think um, looking at a case-by-case -case review, uh, to us what that means is that provides us with uh, an element of flexibility. It does not mean that we are going to ignore um, past licenses or past arms transfers, uh, that we're going to you know, turn a blind eye to any kind of precedent. But what it does give us is it gives us a bit of, of flexibility. All of those various um, considerations that are in the CAP policy that we have to, we have to um, take heed of when we're looking at a, uh, when we're looking at a potential transfer. Um, it's, what's great about the CAP policy is it does not, it does not prioritize any of, the, any of the considerations that are out there. It just lays them out there for us to, con for us to consider. Um, and as, uh, as my boss was saying in a, in a Chamber of Commerce event yet just yesterday, my uh, undersecretary, she says, you know, the world changes from, from week to week, from month, month to month. And so, you know, something that we may have been willing to provide uh, a partner two months ago, maybe something has changed, uh, you can uh, imagine right now, some things have changed such that we're not really quite ready to, uh, to approve that, that transfer uh, today. And um, so that's the kind of case-by-case -case review that we're talking about. It does not mean, uh, just to underline, that we are not going to be consider considering precedents, that we're not going to be looking at past licenses, that um, you know, if a company comes to us and says, well, this is the, the third of, uh, of 10 uh, transfers that we have planned, we're not going to necessarily take that, that third transfer um, and look at it uh, um, without thinking about the about the whole picture, um, so hopefully that allays some of the some of the concerns. But we do have a bit of a um, a bit of a balancing act here with this case by case review and our uh, our desire to, as Alex was talking about, to really try to look proactively um, at what we want to do with partners and allies, um, and that that proactive um, strategic look is is a little bit different from what we're doing on a case by case. Um, um, on the case-by-case -case basis, and it's trying to take into account, you know, what are the things that we want to accomplish as a country? What are the things that have been outlined in the national security strategy and the national defense strategy? And how can we work proactively with our partners and allies to try to realize those, those goals and objectives? Dak? Uh, Andrew, I think it's a great lead-off question for uh, what, we're, what we're talking about here, and I think it's illustrated in one of the reform proposals that the Aerospace Industries Association submitted to the U.S. government. How do you rationalize the case-by-case -case with, a, with a broad overall policy change? And one of the best examples is you look at some of your existing processes, and specifically I'm talking about the concept of a program license. So uh, the, for those that are unfamiliar with a program license, instead of licensing on a case-by-case -case basis on individual, on individual licenses, what you do is you provide a license for an entire program, and then any of the associated licenses that, we are, that are responsible for, the, or that fall under that program, could then be expedited through the U.S. government. Those licenses, that program has already been adjudicated by the United States government. We already see the considerations, whether it's for human rights or humanitarian concerns or technology transfer, all of that has already been adjudicated. And that allows for those licenses to continue through the system, which is already burdened, to move through more quickly than you would do on a case-by-case -case basis. So a program license really is a good solution for one of these um, really thorny issues that we run into when you do overall defense trade and defense trade reform. And we're hopeful that the administration, um, as part of the National Implementation Plan, will look at a program license and uh, consider that particular structure as something that can be considered going forward. Thanks, Andrew. Um, to, to build off that, that point, I mean, I think, you know, there, there is the risk of um, being inundated and overwhelmed um, from a capacity and workforce perspective in terms of the range of inputs that will have to be taken into consideration um, with this policy. It has always been multifaceted. Um, arguably, there are additional layers of complexity um, that, that the administration is endeavoring to, to incorporate, which I think is, is the right approach. Um, but, but perhaps as um, um, a similar but broader effort to, to what DAC and AIA have, have recommended is building a series of archetypes or, or templates 
for the types of challenges uh, that uh, the U.S. national security community is going to encounter when it wrestles with these arms transfer policy decisions. Um, based on the complexity of the context into which we're inserting these arms in terms of the foreign policy trade-offs, in terms of tech release concerns, um, such that you could develop a range of archetypes that, that move along a spectrum of a highly capable ally, um, such as European or Eastern Asian allies, to perhaps a more fractious debate uh, surrounding uh, partners in, in some other parts of the world. Um, so that might be an approach uh, to consider, but it would require all the different nodes of the interagency and also a dialogue with uh, industry, um, Chamber of Commerce, and, and others that have a voice in this process along with civil society and humanitarian actors um, to, to construct these archetypes. Jeff? Just briefly on this, it's an interesting question, as well, and I, I get where it's coming from, but I, I want to sort of maybe stress what Laura was saying. It's really important that you keep this as part of your approach because of the changing dynamics and the changing situations. And, and maybe later we can talk about there should be additional insertion points where you are taking account of changing times. Um, I understand the, the desire here, but I think it's also really important as a, from the idea of responsibility with these sales that there is this case-by-case -case review. Just one uh, addition to what Laura said. I think you know, while maintaining the case-by-case -case review, I think it's important that we do uh, have these big picture policy statements, uh, not only because they convey a sense of, of the administration and the president's intent in this policy throughout the entire, the whole of government approach, but also I think having these economic security, uh, con you know, being able to compete in a great power competition, having all of that as a, a signal of intent to our allies and partners as well as our competitors, I think that's really important. So the, the balance between the big picture signaling and, and kind of the case-by-case -case nuance that, that the interagency needs to do this effectively, I think that's really important. Uh, this discussion kind of brought to mind to me, uh, for those of you who don't know, when, when Keith and I worked together at the Department of Defense, I was head of the rapid acquisition cell, and a lot of what I was doing at that time was trying to uh, facilitate the provision of equipment to the Afghan National Security Forces so that they could um, succeed in their missions. And Keith was my Svengali for trying to manage uh, some of that process. Um, and he would bring home to me that uh, a lot of times the answer to the solution to the problem was uh, to take the easier path. In other words, things that had already been approved in, in a similar context, much easier to approve in, a, in an Afghan context than trying to create some, uh, some brand new path. Not to say that the brand new path can't be done, but it is, uh, it's a lot easier and quicker to do something that's been done before, which kind of brings to mind, and I think Alex, this ties into what you were saying, that if we communicate uh, the government some of these broader policy ideas and, and folks in industry, folks in partner nations have an idea of what is more likely to get yes than no, um, we can maybe cut out some friction. So it definitely seems to me there's a role for kind of these broader policy statements and, and communication. Uh, but that kind of brings me to my next question, which is, you know, how do you see, or how does the panel see, it should be or will be, that um, that we can facilitate and build those kind of communication mechanisms with industry. It was referenced by several folks about wanting to get feedback from industry, but um, you know, sometimes the US government is challenged to communicate back to industry uh, in its processes for a variety of reasons. So I kind of throw that out to the panel. Uh, how do we get this, this kind of dialogue process with industry, with partner nations working effectively? Keith. A couple of thoughts, and um, this issue of transparency we discussed yesterday at the chamber with the undersecretary and, and some of our members. Um, you know, as the administration works through the details of the implementation plan, uh, we really do see a desire uh, for greater transparency on the details of that implementation plan. You know, I, I realize some of it is classified, but there's uh, there's a chunk that is not. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we worked hard in the Pentagon for many years, um, and it was critical to, to my various assignments, is viewing industry as, uh, as a partner. Uh, at times, 
the bureaucracy will try to keep industry at arm's length for a number of, of reasons. Um, and in order to succeed in this, uh, it has to be a very uh, collegial and transparent uh, dialogue with our industry partners and the associations um, and, and our council. And uh, otherwise, we're not going to move forward. And it, 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 it requires an understanding of the technology. So you have to have program management and engineer folks involved as well. Part of the discussion we would often have in the Pentagon is part of the acquisition technology logistics community, uh, where Frank Kendall, for example, or Ash Carter, when he had the position, was beholden to the president and to the warfighter for not approving a transfer or supporting a transfer of capability that would somehow disadvantage U.S. forces. The conversation we would have is, uh, with that industry, and with that capability, within five years, will there be a next generation of something that minimizes the risk of a transfer today? And in some instances, the answer was yes. And so we felt comfortable supporting the administration's desire to transfer cutting edge capability that otherwise might be a bit risky. And in some instances, the answer might be no. And that's a kind of dialogue you need to have uh, to, to move forward in some of these areas. Of course, precedence is critically important. Industry knows where they've had licenses approved in the past. They know where the swim lanes are on go, no go. Um, however, there are opportunities that press against those swim lanes that create the opportunity for new precedence. India is a great example over the past five years, raising the bar in the relationship with India. That came with a great deal of discussion and dialogue and it, a very close partnership with industry on F-16s, F-18s, et cetera. Uh, so I think, I think we need transparency and we need a very strong and open dialogue to move forward. Andrew, if I might, uh, let me give an example. I actually think that there is an existing structure, an existing mechanism that is ongoing right now that uh, AIA has been a part of for a number of years, and it's through a series of dialogues that occurs at multiple levels in, in, in the government and in industry. And so we have a CEO level dialogue that we hold with the Secretary or Deputy Secretary of Defense, and then we have an undersecretary level that's held with division presidents, and then we have a mid-tier dialogue that we continue to run with other associations as well. And so there are multiple levels of conversations that are ongoing. Um, that I think that we can formalize, that we can uh, continue to pursue with the U.S. government in such a way that achieves the reforms that we have, that we all agree need to go forward. Um, the key for us is to make sure that we focus on security cooperation, defense trade, overall trade as the topic that is selected. Because the challenge that you suddenly start to have is at the senior level and at the just, just under that very senior level is that you have competing demands for multiple issues across the range. So it's not just security cooperation that the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of State or the Under Secretary of State or Defense has, is responsible for. They are responsible for, for a number of things. And so it's being very specific about what you're trying to achieve. And defense trade is very, is very specific. So if we can focus on security cooperation and defense trade at that senior level and have it be um, baked into the bureaucracy, then we're going to make some real change. Because right now, um, we are having those dialogues. They tend to be um, episodic at best, but if we can formalize those and put those and have them be enduring going forward, then you're going to see the level of change that we think is necessary in order to accomplish the, um, the reforms that are going to be part of the national implementation plan. Um, I would just want to add on to uh, what Dak was saying. We have um, a number of standing meetings with, um, with associations, uh, with AIA, with uh, NDIA and others, where we try to engage uh, the broad spectrum of, uh, of industry stakeholders with, um, with the, the consideration of the new CAP policy and the implementation plan. Um, the administration has really tried to make an extra effort to increase that, uh, increase that engagement. Um, we've had a series of roundtable meetings um, with associations bringing in their membership, trying to make sure that we're reaching out not just to, to primes, but also to small and medium uh, sized companies as well to make sure we get a range of, uh, a range of um, input. 
Um, we also understand, too, that sometimes in these um, broader dialogues, it's, it, uh, folks may be somewhat reticent to talk to us. So our doors uh, are always open to, um, to folks, whether it's associations or um, think tanks or uh, companies. Uh, to meet um, in our various offices, whether it's State Department at the Undersecretary, Assistant Secretary, or office level, uh, whether it's the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, whether it's um, uh, Undersecretary Lord at, um, in uh, ANS, all across the, um, the security cooperation landscape, I think there's been an extra effort to try to make sure that we engage to understand what the, what the various concerns are. Um, we had said when we started on this process that we were not go just gonna be looking for input to the implementation plan, write the plan, put it out there, and then say, okay, thanks, we're done, talk to y'all later. Uh, we really do want to make sure that this is just the beginning of our engagement and we continue to, um, to reach out to folks. I've told some of our, some of our colleagues that uh, last week we, um, we held the first um, meeting of the uh, interagency offset working group that was reestablished pursuant to the implementation plan. Uh, and in our first meeting, we said that one of the first things we need to do is reach back out to industry and, and through the associations to find out, you know, what is the perception of offsets? What is the perception out there of what the U.S. government should be doing as its offset policy? What are the comp uh, countries out there where uh, offset policies are perceived to be really um, incredibly onerous such that our, our companies cannot effectively compete? So it's that kind of situation where you're going to see this ongoing uh, ongoing engagement from us on a number of different a number of different issues. And if I could just follow up on the topic of, um, and it was raised by Ms. Ambassador Cadnow about resourcing, resourcing uh, the process. And I'm always loath to criticize my former colleagues, but uh, I would say I think there's some challenge there. And I would point f as a for instance to uh, some of the early stages of this year's defense authorization bill, uh, kind of targeted. Um, for example, the Defense Technology Security uh, Administration potentially to be folded into other aspects of the department, uh, but abolished as an independent entity. And there is pressure. There's pressure in the system, both within the Department of Defense and the Department of State, to, um, uh, to streamline, to be efficient, to reduce uh, billets in certain areas, and, and in particular in the kinds of things that tend to support the export, arms export policy, like contracting, like uh, technology security reviews. So how do, you, how do you strike that balance? How do you effectively make sure that the resourcing that's required to, to be proactive rather than reactive, and I would, I would postulate or argue that that may be harder to do, uh, require more uh, staff effort to accomplish than just to be reactive uh, in an environment. Now, I, I, should, I should add that some of those early proposals in defense authorization bill were not in the final conference report, but there were still some reductions mandated. So I just appreciate thoughts on that. Is that directed at me? <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. To uh, sure. So uh, resourcing is um, is a concern. Uh, it's a concern, I think, among all of our agencies. Um, I can't necessarily speak to speak to DoD, but um, you know they they have some concerns. Co contracting, especially, uh, is one area that um, all of us collectively point to as a as a real need for uh, increased resourcing. In in my department, in in my bureau, I think it's very well known that the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls is um, is quite uh, understaffed at the moment, um, down considerably, uh, and we also have vacancies uh, here and there. Uh, and it's something that our leadership is very much, um, very much aware of, um, and we are going to be, you know, seeking to try to fill those, fill those uh, spots. But, you know, Andrew, you, you mentioned it yourself. There are stresses on the system, you know, where we are, you know, being asked to do more with less, um, and you know, we have to prioritize our work. Um, Luckily, luckily for me, this is a top priority. So, <laughs> so we, uh, you know, there we have a, a fair number of folks uh, in my office and in other offices in the department that are working on uh, working on these tasks that are outlined in the implementation plan. Okay, I'm going to raise us up a level now and uh, kind of shift the focus somewhat, not to preclude anyone talking about implementation um, or the intent of the policy, but shift us up a level to, to the more strategic uh, perspective of how arms transfers generally and, and the policy that we're discussing 
fits into the strategic framework. And of course, it's been addressed uh, several times already uh, in terms of the national security strategy and the leadership focus uh, and the need to engage in, uh, uh, or at least be prepared to engage in peer, uh, peer competition. Uh, and so to kind of give us some opening thoughts on that, um, I'm going to start first with Melissa. Well, thanks so much, Andrew, and I'm uh, very delighted to be joining today's uh, panel in partnership with, with Andrew. Um, starting in, in March, uh, we, we launched an effort to really start to unpack uh, the, the complexity of the defense trade agenda with an event here at CSIS that featured uh, the DSCA Director, Lieutenant General Hooper, um, and Mike Miller, also from, from State uh, Paul Mill Bureau, um, and really looking forward to continuing this, this project stream uh, with Andrew in the months to come, I'm sure we'll be harvesting uh, many insights from, from today's discussion. I also want to thank uh, Mara McQuaid and Hijab Shah for organizing uh, today's event. Too often, we think about and approach arms sales in terms of the input to the partner and the output for the United States. Um, I think we've seen in recent congressionally mandated reforms for security cooperation that are underway at the State Department and the Department of Defense that encourage the, the whole community to think more and drive towards outcomes. Um, and indeed, if we want to compete and win in the ways that have been framed by this administration, it hinges on our ability to articulate and achieve those outcomes. The, the fact is, as Ambassador Kednow uh, stated in her remarks, is that arms sales are a foreign policy tool that may well reap U.S. economic and strategic benefits, but are fundamentally a political act that have political outcomes. And in shaping the monopoly of the use of force within the partner country that we are working with and how that force is used. And so as we are thinking about the outcomes that, that we are seeking to achieve politically, it has to take into consideration that broader sweep of, of considerations. I believe that the intent is there in terms of how the administration is designing its security cooperation reforms, again, mandated by Congress, um, and I think as reflected in the, the framing and priorities of, of the CAT, but it's worth underscoring that arms transfers should be designed to build allied and partner capability and interoperability, to mitigate risk in US plans for managing crisis and contingencies, for deterrence and coercion against our adversaries, for countering terrorism and other national security objectives. Internal to the U US government, this will necessitate greater linkage between the planning community and the security cooperation community and joint planning with our partners beyond which is currently practice. There are impediments, of course, to this uh, from a classification perspective, uh, in terms of tech release considerations, and in terms of, of cultural barriers, not just between uh, the United States and its partners, but between uh, the different cultures that exist uh, within the, the US bureaucracy, and in fact, between the planning community and the security cooperation community. Um, but in order to break through those barriers and ensure stronger alignment with defense and national security priorities, um, we need to think about ways to uh, better streamline and provide top-down direction for the imperative of, of thinking about security cooperation as a way to achieve our, our planning objectives. Arm transfer policy also needs to be reconciled with two other priorities that have been articulated by the Trump administration. The first is the return on investment for uh, working with allies and partners, and why context matters um, in terms of avoiding being embroiled in protracted conflicts, including those that, that are pursued by our partners and to whom we might be providing arms. 
To start with return on investment, um, in the last two NDAA cycles, uh, there has been an emphasis on reforming and reinforcing the requirements for planning for assessment, monitoring, and evaluation of security cooperation. And of course, the, the President himself and members of the administration have been quite strong um, in encouraging allies to, to step up and do more uh, to, to invest in uh, our collective security. Arms transfers are, of course, a form of security cooperation. So in thinking ahead of how we uh, frame and, and reconcile the imperative of seeking return on investment with the need to uh, be streamlining our arms transfer processes and, and policies to, to provide those arms to, to other partners, I think we'll need to be uh, wrestled with at, at the highest levels of, of our government. Um, if they are treated as separate policy decision-making processes, we run the risk as a country of parallel and possibly conflicting outputs and, and outcomes um, that we will have to uh, deal with in, in the years to come. Context also matters. Um, arms transfers further uh, the by, with, and through approach of relying on allies and partners to achieve common security objectives, um, not only through burden sharing, but also burden shifting. Um, we've seen this approach increasingly utilized, not just by this administration, um, but, but frankly also by the, the Obama administration, and for good reasons. Our, our partners oftentimes have better understanding of the lay of the land um, for complex operations. Uh, they, they speak the language. Um, they will hold the keys to, to that country's future in terms of, of providing security over the long term and ensuring that our interests are met there. Um, and Arms transfers may well achieve common objectives for both the United States and the partner, but we need to think through whether the outcomes are sustainable and supporting of our broader foreign policy objectives in, in these country contexts. And they must be calibrated not to inadvertently elevate partner expectations that the United States will not be able to match. Um, whether that's the type and sophistication of arms that we would like to provide them, but also the political implications of continuing a military cooperation relationship with them um, over the long term. That we're not inadvertently empowering bad actors, that we're not reinforcing predatory governance, and that we're not exacerbating conflict dynamics that may undermine our collective security in certain regions or that we're causing civilian harm. And I, I do want to applaud uh, the administration for strengthening the civilian harm provision in, in the new CAP policy, and I hope that that is, uh, is well implemented. And I'd like to, to point you all to uh, the administration's own uh, stabilization assistance review that just came out uh, in June, a uh, collective effort by the Department of State, Department of Defense, and the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, um, which links uh, some of these very complex uh, scenarios where we're conducting stability operations with security assistance, security cooperation, and the need to be thoughtful about how we're designing our security cooperation programs in these contexts. So for this administration, context does matter, um, but it does seem to be in tension, um, at least from an outsider's perspective, with uh, some of the imperatives driving in, in the arms transfer policy. Um, so while we, we need to design a, a policy that is, is responsive and adaptive to the competitive landscape of the 21st century to support our allies and partners in achieving common objectives, uh, those decisions are, are incredibly multifaceted. Uh, you can see by the CSIS challenging the, the length of CSIS panels to, uh, today in our attempt to, to bring together the multifaceted dimension of, of these issues. Um, but given the greater reliance on U.S. allies and partners heightens the, the importance of calibrating our, our approach uh, to consider these, these different policy objectives, providing feedback opportunities to refine them um, so that we are achieving our desired outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you, and thanks so much for inviting me to be on this panel. I may be the most... Um, unhappy with the policy on the panel, so that's the role I'll happily take on. Um, 
there's a lot I'd like to talk about, and I've been taking a lot of notes because I wanted to tailor to what's been said so far. Uh, there's an issue brief that I authored through the Arms Control Association that came out a couple months ago, which lays out some of the points I will make. Uh, I'm also, as mentioned, part of the forum on the arms trade, which is a network of 70 people, I think, at this point around the world, about a third of which are here in DC, who initially responded to the transfer policy when it came out. Um, we have a page on our website on the, on the Arms Transfer Initiative where you can see some of those reactions and ongoing uh, things that have been written since then. There's a great deal of concern, actually, uh, about this policy. Now, every conventional arms transfer policy is kind of a word soup. You can find almost anything you want in there, and as mentioned, the, the priorities there are not weighted. They're, they're just listed. Um, I'm concerned that uh, the optics and the reality of how this policy might be implemented are looking at the wrong problem. Um, so I, I just want to frame a few things so that I can explain how I see this differently and then talk about how I think this matters to the world. Uh, there are some assumptions I'm hearing that I, I sort of reject as a frame. One, that if others do it, if others are going to fill the gap, we have to fill it. I don't think that's ever a rationale for transferring what is not a trade commodity. These are weapons. These are killing machines. And it's easy to talk about them in the abstract, but that is their purpose. And, uh, and in our economy, they aren't that huge of an art, a piece of our economy. But for those of us who care about it, they have an outweighing impact on our world, our country, and the world. And we never need to forget that. We can't talk about the arms trade as sort of an anodized, clean system. It is dangerous. And I don't think we've figured out exactly how to do it right over time. Um, and we can easily go through the litany of uh, past arms transfers that seem to make sense that no longer do. And that's the problem, I think, that every conventional arms transfer policy should take at its root, which is how do we make sure we do it responsibly? And I appreciated Ambassador Kadnow's uh, message that we do want to continue to do this responsibly, and I do believe that is what is in people's hearts. Um, but as she said, each delivery sends a message. And my concerns here are when we stress the economic side of this, that is what is seen. Um, and when President Trump meets with the, the Saudis and holds up posters of weapons and the amounts of sales, the message being perceived in the world is that the human rights, the other concerns, the security, they don't matter. It's a transactional approach. Um, it's about faster and more. And faster and more could be a recipe for disaster. These are some of the concerns that are in, in that it need to be take, taken into account. Um, there's uh, this idea that the higher technology weapons are the ones that matter, and so there's an export control reform process on categories one to three of the USML, which was briefly mentioned, which I find really alarming, the, the prospect that will be actually make it much easier for semi-automatic weapons to go around the world. These are often the weapons used in conflict. These are often the weapons that are driving human rights abuses. The rationale that, well, these aren't high sophisticated weapons, so we don't need to pay as much attention, is driven from this idea that our approach needs to be more and faster, and we need to protect only the crown jewels, which is a continuation of the Obama administration, but never got to these pieces. So there's all these parts that are going on that I think are the wrong message. One of the other portions of this is if we do want to create responsibility, and this is where I'll be interested in as we have the panel to discuss this, where there might be some overlaps. So there's a lot of discussion in here about timelines and milestones, right? I mean, that, I understand industry is one for that. I understand the idea that you want to move faster. Um, a number of us have met with the people working on the policy, and are, I think most of us are disappointed that none of our suggestions about a little bit more transparency in those timelines and milestones would be helpful. I think industry would probably also support that. Um, I think also if we're going to move faster and more, we need to have at the tail end a better sense of how we're going to use end use restrictions and end use monitoring, and we need to have better transparency afterwards so we can test. And I appreciate Melissa talking about there is a much greater push today to assess whether our security assistance, our efforts are actually achieving the goals. My concern is we're going to move faster and we're going to not improve our transparency or our processes along the way such that we can assess later whether this was an experiment that was worth taking. Um, I think it's also critical, as we mentioned, that along the process, if there are these milestones, that those are insertion points where you can reevaluate whether the deal that was made however many months or years ago still makes sense. And a small piece of this could be Congress that gave itself the power to get a pre-delivery notification. 
Um, it's only used as power once on a Middle East sale, but this could be a standard process and it could be public. Similarly, direct commercial sales, which get notified to Congress but don't have the same website as foreign military sales, those could be made public at, at the same time. My, my thinking here is that if we're gonna do this, if this is the drive for the administration to faster and more, um, that we need to have at the same time a more transparent process and one that the public can engage in a little bit more frequently because um, I think we are seeing, interestingly, in this new first two years of the Trump administration, um, Congress is paying a bit more attention. You have some holds right now on some sales that have been really concerning that I thought were going through on weapons to Saudi Arabia and the UAE on precision guided munitions. You have some holds on appointments and so on and so forth. But Congress needs to step up its game, but it needs to be helped by um, the public, and I don't think that can be inconsistent. I think it can be worked into the policy, but I think the message of the policy is not one that promotes international responsibility, but instead one that promotes transactions and sales, not human rights, and I, that is a, a very alarming. Well, thank you, Dak. Andrew, thank you. Obviously, I you know, can't thank you enough for the opportunity to be here today, and to my U.S. government colleagues, not only here on the panel, but also in the audience, I uh, want to thank you so much for all of your work so far in the conventional arms transfer policy. Uh, the Aerospace Industries Association has been working on this particular item for a number of years now, and please understand that uh, AIA and its member companies, as well as the 2.4 million aerospace and defense workers across this country, are appreciative for your efforts to date. I'd also like to call out Ambassador Caden now. Um, she's been a stalwart partner with AIA and with the U.S. aerospace and defense industry for a number of years, and uh, her team has been absolutely outstanding. And so Laura's presence here on the panel is, uh, should not go unnoticed. Um, they have been uh, at our call. They've been very responsive to um, issues that we bring to them. I want to really thank you for, the, for that opportunity. I uh, want to very quickly go through a couple of things. The first I want to talk about is the strategic linkages that Andrew spoke about. The second, I want to talk just a little bit about what the AIA recommendations were for government action, talk a little bit about the country relationships, and then, frankly, trying to wrap some of this up, where does all of this lead? So first of all, the conventional arms transfer policy we thought was the very first critical step in addressing some of the key reforms that we need in the U.S. defense trade system. Uh, it has been a pillar of the U.S. foreign policy for decades, and we see that it's going to continue to be a pillar of foreign policy uh, going forward. AIA and its member companies have focused on this issue for a number of years, and we're very excited to see some of the progress that we're making now. At its core, the conventional arms transfer policy and the reforms associated with it is in support of foreign policy and national security objectives of the United States, as laid out in the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. And in the national security strategy, the reforms to the conventional arms transfer that we see that coincide with, the, with those reforms are renewing America's competitive edge and reducing the regulatory burdens. In the national defense strategy, we find key objectives like strengthening alliances and attracting new partners, deepening interoperability, and fostering a competitive mindset to be central to the goals of the conventional arms transfer policy. So the point in, in going through all of that is that there is a direct linkage between the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and the conventional arms transfer policy that has been, that has been identified. And so we see a strategic linkage from what the direction of the United States is, the United States government is, and the conventional arms transfer reforms. We see those linkages as key to reforms going forward. Now, earlier this summer, AIA send in some recommended government actions uh, as a result of a dialogue that we've had with AIA member companies, both large and small. And those fell into 11 different areas. And for, if you're interested, uh, the AIA website, aia-aerospace.org, has those recommendations. But it really fell into key areas, and those include identifying specific priorities, addressing key reforms in the foreign military sales system, specifically contracting, non-program of record, and reform to, the, to um, FMS only uh, related transactions, examining the arms transfer and technology reviews, re review release process, licensing, and then industrial cooperation, we commonly refer to that as offsets. So those were 11 categories of recommendations that AIA recommended. When we saw the fact sheet that came out in uh, the middle of July, we saw many of the themes associated with those recommendations carried forward by the U.S. government. We were very excited to see those, uh, those themes coming forward. But the next step and the critical step is the implementation. And you've heard it re referred to here in the National Implementation Plan. One of the things that we really need to do is have a, um, a key 
a system that is set up where the industry can provide feedback to the government during the implementation stage. As I said earlier on uh, one of the other questions, we really need to bake in the feedback mechanism from industry to government to e be able to realize some of the changes that are being recommended in the conventional arms transfer policy. Effective coordination mechanisms between industry and government are gonna be key um, because the, the objective here is to reduce the burden on the system. So one of the questions that we had earlier today was about uh, was about resourcing. Well, one of the easiest things to, to handle resourcing is to identify the things in the system that you don't need to do anymore. And so we did that as part of the export control reform initiative. So what are the things in the export control system that we don't need to do anymore and how can we reduce, reduce the burdens? So if you have a resourcing issue, then, it, then look at the system that you currently have and see what you don't necessarily have to do anymore because situation has evolved. That's one of the ways that you really get to the resourcing piece. Now, where does all of this lead? So one of the things that has been missing from some of this discussion, and I'd like to emphasize in, in forums like this, is the role of the ultimate end user of the items that we are transferring, and that is our foreign partners. So how do our foreign partners, if you were to take off your shoes and put on their shoes, how do you think our foreign partners feel about the U.S. conventional arms system? And what I would submit to you, having talked with a lot of these foreign partners, is they are as frustrated as we are. Because their objective is to control their own national security, to meet their own national security objectives, and to be key partners with the United States. We think about it one directionally. We want key partners and allies. Well, our partners also want key partners and allies, and that main partner for many of them around the world is the United States. And we want to make sure that we are meeting their national security objectives through our foreign military cell system, just like we are meeting our own national security objectives. So where does all of this lead ultimately? So at the end of the day, this is a very competitive market. There are foreign competitor countries, there are foreign companies, they are all looking to get a leg up. They're all looking to take market share from US companies, but it's not necessarily about market share. They are looking to expand their global influence. So the race that we're actually running is a race for global influence. And for 50 years, the United States has set the standard for the race in global influence. The question that we have, and that we think by some of these reforms that we see that are coming as part of the National Implementation Plan, is who is going to make the rules for global influence for the next 50 years? And as an industry, as a country, and as a government, we feel like the United States is poised to continue to set the standard and make the rules for the next 50 years. And that's why we are excited about the potential change in the conventional arms transfer policy, the reforms that are coming forward, and we think that we um, have set the stage for a really good action going forward. So with that, Andrew, I'll stop, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Jack. And I, I want to kind of follow up a little bit on what you said, but there was a common thread, I think, to uh, your comments, Jeff's comments, and Melissa's comments, which gets at the question of how do we evaluate whether our policy is succeeding or failing at promoting the strategic objectives that, uh, that, that it is designed to support in our broader uh, strategic framework. Um, so, you know, there was some critiques of deal flow as a metric. There was uh, arguments for end use monitoring as one way of assessing what we're achieving. And uh, I think there's a lot of other potential metrics out there. But I'd kind of be interested in the broader panel's thoughts on how you assess that, you know, in a year's time, uh, if we do a six month check in, a year's check in farther down the road. Do we say to ourselves, yeah, the policy is working, it's having the intended result, or we might need to fine tune some things, and I would postulate that you always need to fine tune things over time, so I don't mean that as a critique. But, but how do you see that assessment process uh, playing out? And, and I should just mention that, um, and it's been referenced, but you know, that the FY17 National Defense Authorization Bill really expressed strong congressional interest in trying to understand the strategic context of, of this and assess it and, and bring some more visibility to whether we're achieving our objectives in our security cooperation efforts. Uh, so let me turn that to the panel and see what thoughts we can get. And Alex, if, I would like to tap you first if you're willing to go first. I think one metric um, that the president himself has, has set is he would like to see more sales that are successful. 
He would like to see um, he would like to see sales that that meet the requirements that are laid out in this policy, that are evaluated with all the criteria that we, the State Department and the interagency deem appropriate. But he would like to see an increase in in our defense exports, and he's been the most vigorous advocate of doing that. And I think we saw 2017 set a record for defense sales. 2018 looks that it will continue it will uh, continue in that trajectory, and I think that's. That's a metric. That's an important metric. Um, and I, I think as to strengthening our strategic partnerships, I think that's going to be um, harder to quantify. But I think we will. I think you will continue to see, um, you know, as more sales are are consummated, I think that's also going to be a sign of the continuing strengthening of our strategic partnerships. So that's those are two metrics that will, um, you know, they've they've been showing themselves since the start of this presidency, and I think as this policy is implemented and we continue down that road, I think we're gonna see more of that. Mark? Thanks, I, I think um, metrics are metrics are difficult, uh, difficult in this uh, area in particular. Um, quantities of sales, of course, is, is one way to measure how we're doing, but it's definitely not, uh, not the only one, as, as Alex mentioned. Um, for us in this business, um, when you talk to those of us in, in my office and my counter, counterparts in DOD, um, we often say that we're not looking to sell items um, to countries. What we're looking at is trying to, do, uh, trying to build uh, capabilities in our partners, um, not just selling them something and walking away. We want to make sure that our partners and allies are more capable and able to work with us uh, when we need them to, um, to be more able to effectively defend themselves. Um, and so it's, it's hard to quantify that, and that can be very, very squishy, uh, technical term, but um, it's something that we do need to do, you know, as we are selling things to African counterparts. Okay, well, what does that mean? How are they, how are they implementing, uh, implementing the things that we are selling? You know, are countries able to better perform with U.S. Um, with U.S. warfighters in various operations uh, and the like, I think that that needs to be factored factored in as well. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, sales are important, but it's uh, making sure that we are building the capabilities of our partners. Keith, I'm building on what Laura um, was saying, you have a national security strategy, and from that national security strategy, you have a military strategy. From that strategy, you have combatant commanders globally who have wartime planning uh, documentation that's all classified, but they know what they would like to see their partners and allies in the region, the AOR, uh, have as capability. And in my time in the Pentagon, when there were very spirited debates about highly technical capability moving to a partner for a first time introduction, we would always go back to wartime planning doctrine and look at how that capability supported the combatant commander's objectives in the national security strategy. So to me, that is another way to measure uh, success. Uh, that's not something that's discussed publicly, uh, but it is in, inside the administration a way to measure uh, success as well. Jeff? Thanks, and I forgot to say when I was speaking before that, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, not on behalf of the Arms Control Association and others. I think it's a really tough question because um, it's weapons as a part of any security solution are a, a long-term proposition. Um, so it's hard to say after six months whether you know, that has succeeded. Um, but I think you have to pick your metrics properly, and maybe one of those is how are the recipient countries using or changing their practices? I mean, this is one of the pieces that was, um, I'd say, sold to the community of uh, my community that's con concerned about how the U.S. does its policies, that there will be this in interest on protection of civilians, training as was required for, for transfers to Nigeria and Saudi Arabia will be a critical component. Ambassador Cadnell talked about this in terms of um, the human rights concerns and making sure the capacities are there. Those would be the metrics I'm looking at. Are we seeing countries who are receiving U.S. weaponry um, 
if we're concerned about their behavior, changing their behavior. Uh, we have this sort of belief that if we're a partner with the country, we're going to have control over what they do. But oftentimes, uh, that isn't the case. I would argue that the Saudis have not been good actors, however much influence we've tried to act on them as they're reacting to the situation in Yemen. Um, and often, I think we actually end up getting captured, which I think Melissa was talking about. Sometimes the countries we sell weapons to, we end up getting embroiled in conflicts in ways that we weren't expecting. Um, how you measure that, I think you pay attention to those hard places and see if you see progress. Ultimately, it's about whether you're creating peace and security, which is one of the hard, hardest things to measure. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Um, it, as I alluded to in my um, opening thoughts, there, there are robust processes underway and, and good thinking happening both at DOD and state in terms of how to conduct assessment, monitoring, and evaluation. It is a congressionally mandated task in the FY17 NDAA um, that DOD in particular has to uh, create an AMNE framework for Section 333, Title 10, um, building partnership capacity activities. Um, I think over time there will be an effort, and I understand from state colleagues that there is a desire to encompass Title 22 uh, grant-based security assistance in similar frameworks and some pilot attempts underway at state to do that. Um, what I was trying to stress in, in my opening remarks is that whether, it, regardless of the input, whether it's grant assistance or arm sales through FMS, you're still achieving the same effects in, in the country, right? You're driving towards interoperability, building partner capacity, capability, retaining access, retaining influ influence in relationships. Um, and so ought we not be using the same framework to evaluate our outcomes, our objectives with our partner, um, regardless of the input to, to that system? My sense is, again, as an outsider, is that those processes are being bifurcated right now. Okay, I want to open up at this point to audience questions. You've been a very patient audience, uh, and so <laughs> we appreciate that. And uh, you know, I'm kind of torn. I'm sitting here thinking I wish I had a Hill person on the panel and a, and a DoD person, which we did seek on the panel, and didn't work out. But I can only imagine how long we would have had to keep you if we if we had. But let me start here uh, with Colin. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Um, I am a grizzled veteran of watching these. Uh, I go back almost as far as Keith, the Defense Trade Security Initiative, wonderful ideas. They were going to change everything. Everything was going to be faster, better, more wonderful. Um, not to be snide, but a lot of this sounds similar, although there's less focus on process than there was in the DTSI, I think. Um, so my question would be, OK, uh, the laws and regulations haven't changed. How do you actually, aside from pushing people to say yes more often, actually get things done? <laughs> Laura, please. We were looking at me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, excellent question. Um, I think I, I tried to allude to this a little bit when I was uh, making my opening remarks, um, where we have a, a situation right now where, um, you know, for the past several years, uh, before this administration even, you know, we were hearing, as Dak had mentioned, we were hearing from partners, we were hearing from a lot of folks that, you know, we're slow, uh, we can't compete, uh, we take too long to make decisions, we take too long to produce our stuff, we really, you know, we produce wonderful stuff, but it's too expensive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mostly focused on the foreign military sales process. And so um, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency uh, under, um, uh, then Director Admiral, Admiral Rixey really uh, tried to uh, take a look at reforming, reforming the process. Um, and he, they ran into some, some bumps along the way. Um, but now what we have is we have uh, kind of top-down direction um, from the White House that we need to really um, take a better look at, at how we're doing things. And we have, the, we have that top cover to implement those kinds of changes that will make the FMS process you know, smoother, where we could try to address the real contracting issues that we have, that we can look at non-program of record uh, um, 
items that take forever to get through the, the, um, the technical disclosure um, process, those kinds of things. So I think what has really changed is that, is that um, the buy-in from the top level. And it's, you know, it's the White House, but it's not just the White House. Um, you talk to uh, the Secretary of State or the Secretary of Defense or the deputies or the undersecretaries, and everyone is very much aware of all of the different things that we're doing and very much behind us. So I think that's, you know, in the absence of, um, you know, other, other documents and legislation and, and, and the like, you really, you really do have a, a change situation with the, um, you know, with the top-down direction. Keith, if you'd like to jump back in. Um, so, um, the reason why I agreed to head this council at the chamber is because I believe there's a unique opportunity and interest by this administration at the highest levels in a way that is unprecedented. Let's look at export control reform. It was tried by the Clinton administration, but half-heartedly. It was tried by the George W. Bush administration half-heartedly. It wasn't until the Obama team came on board with Secretary Gates' support and direct intervention that export control reform actually happened. That is what it takes. Um, the proposals that we put forward um, to, to the White House, uh, 30 proposals, were very detailed. It was 16 pages based on my experience and the experience of others. It doesn't mean that all, that is the only way to get this done, but it has to be a very specific driven, solution driven, detail driven, rose pinned on someone to see it through. Uh, that is the only way that we will see true transformation. Let's look at contracting. It takes over 300 days to get a major system on contract under an FMS case because you have a contracting community in the Pentagon that is decimated in numbers, that is grossly understaffed. Uh, they are overwhelmed with the current fight supporting U.S. forces and then supporting allied forces in the current fight, and then FMS comes along as a third priority for contracting. That's why you have the unprecedented use of UCAS, undefinitized uh, contracting actions. That is an opportunity, potentially, with the administration to look at carving out with the Congress's support unique federal acquisition regulation procedures for FMS contracting to have a truly rapid process. Um, that's going to take a whole of community support and we the chamber are willing to help with that but that's just one little example but if you look at export control reform over two decades how did that actually get done that's a roadmap for how to get this done instead of continuing to talk about it i want to um, quickly just say one thing so what has changed it's a great question the easy answer is, is that your global security environment has changed and uh, our U.S. government colleagues see it in their bilateral discussions. Our industry members see it when they meet with customers. We see it in the daily media about how great powers are emerging, um, how certain countries are moving to align themselves. So the, the global security environment is changing and continues to change and is dynamic. It is not fixed. And there has been a recognition by the administration. There's been a recognition by um, our friends in our agencies, and there's been a recognition by industry that the global security environment is, is shifting, the dynamic is changing quickly, and that it, we need to make some key reforms in order to ensure that we are meeting the challenges of the next 50 years. So your global security environment has changed. And after 15 plus years of conflict, um, we should expect that the environment should have should change and is going to continue to change. That is why we think that some of the recommendations that we put forward um, allow the U.S. government, allow industry to be flexible, to be nimble, to be able to react quickly to a, a world that is going to that's going to change and change very quickly. Thank you, Rick Weir from Northrop Grumman. I'm going to couch this question in a quote from Keith Webster. <laughs> Consequence of a denial filled by China. What's the will 
at the White House, Alex, or at State Department to make changes to this aggregate of CAT is filled with a, a number of policies that seem to need some significant changes, like a sovereign decision, for instance, in MTCR to, to treat aircraft like aircraft and missiles like missiles. What's the will to move on those challenging, very hard choices? I think the, the will is demonstrated by the level of engagement that you see publicly and privately on this issue. I mean, the fact that you have um, principal level officials talking about these issues on a regular basis. You have my boss, Peter Navarro, has written, to my count, two op-eds, two national op-eds on, on CAT. Um, you've got uh, Ambassador Caden now going to numerous forums, both Farm Bro, Chamber of Commerce events today, talking about these issues. So I think, I, I, you know, Keith was uh, was talking about the, you know, his experience going back 30 years and not having seen this level of administration engagement on a topic like this. I, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And, and to your point about making, how do we, you know, what is the level of commitment? I think it's demonstrated by the, the personalities involved in, and what their, uh, their public statements. I would just direct you to, to those. Uh, come just right here. The Good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Veronica Cartier. I'm a think tank and focus on the security sector, including nuclear policy. So my intention is in the um, future risk. That's what I'm, um, I would like to focus on. Uh, my comment is, I think, is the CAT policy should include risk policy. And um, the security monitoring body should be considered, which is primarily just focused in the future risk. For example, how could we be so sure after we transfer the weapon not to be retransferred somewhere else? And the second, um, uh, does United States still have the technology control of the transfer weapon? Um, I think that uh, primary and uh, yeah, as we, we, we all know that we are changing world, our ally become adversary and vice versa. We should consider that. Thank you. Okay. So risk, how does risk fit into the policy? Um, so risk is something that we have to, I think we have to factor into every decision that we make. Um, I, all of my colleagues are very aware of risk, whether you're looking at the release of a technology, um, the, the sale of a system, uh, the, the situation within that country, the situation within that region. Um, so I would say that the, uh, the assessment of risk is baked into the entire process um, from the beginning to the end, including end use monitoring, uh, whether it's a, a direct commercial sale or a foreign military sale. We also have uh, very strict uh, retransfer provisions that are with Within um, the uh, whether it's uh, again whether it's a direct commercial sale and built into the license or whether uh, it's a foreign military sale and built and built into the built into the contract or the the letter of offer of an, and acceptance. Um, so uh, in order to retransfer uh, uh, an item, they have to come back to my office uh, if it's a foreign military sale to get that kind of um, that kind of uh, uh, approval. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then we have, you know, we have other provisions to deal with countries um, that transfer um, in contravention of their agreements. So I would say that uh, we're very much aware of risk. Um, uh, Jeff has pointed out the kinds of things that we're, we're dealing in. We're not talking about paper. Uh, we're not talking about transferring. Um, we're talking about transferring lethal equipment. So risk is something that's baked in, I think, every step of the way. Jeff? It's easy to forget that, I mean, the U.S. is by far the world's largest arms dealer and growing its share. Um, if you look at the CIPRI reports, the U.S. is not suffering, it's, it's growing. Um, and it has a great influence and for decades has argued for a responsible arms trade. And I think as we assess the policy, if this is setting the, the standard for the next 50 years, is it the standard we want other countries to follow? I think that 
Um, if it is, we need to make that portion of the case. And if we are concerned that some countries aren't acting as responsibly as they should, how do we convince them to act more responsibly? And, and that's where I think we stress these end use monitoring agreements. We stress pieces of our continuing process that we want other countries to, to follow. And it's, it, it's an unfair criticism to say this, but I don't think this administration is, or this president is particularly proud or fond of multilateralism, but ultimately that is, I think, the, the approach you have to take here. Um, there is an arms trade treaty the U.S. has signed in 100 countries, almost all of our allies included are part of it. Um, and how do we figure out ways to build the multilateral system at the same time? Because if the problem is other countries acting poorly and we're presenting a model, is that model one that they're going to want to replicate? If we figure out how to do it faster and better, how do we show we're doing it, taking account of all these risks? So, Andrew, if I can just very quickly, I, I, I want to say something differently about risk than, than what I think other panelists have said. So, risk can be mitigated. So, risk can be mitigated by by processes. That that part is true. I think that's what you've heard. But risk is also mitigated by relationships, and and I want to emphasize that because the government to government relationship that occurs between the United States and other countries is so critical to ensuring that whatever risk we think there is in transferring an item is mitigated is really important. But the other relationship that is developed that we don't talk about very often is the relationship between the industry partner and the country in question. Because those relationships are baked in for years. Because what happens is, as soon as you start working with a country, you also start working with their supply chain, with their in-country partners, and those relationships are developed and continue and endure even um, beyond the government-to-government -government relationships. So we don't necessarily talk about those relationships very often, and so what you will see is that risk reduction occur both on the government-to-government -government level as well as the industry-to-country level. That is so important in making sure that you are making the right decisions when it comes uh, to sales in, in countries around the world. Quickly, I'm sorry. So I just want to make a couple of, of quick comments. Uh, yes, our defense industries do an incredibly good job internationally today. The focus of my work is ensuring that they do as well in 15 to 20 years as they do today. And part of the change in the dynamic is the evolution and success of competitors like China and others who are going to make that more challenging for our industries 15 to 20 years from today. Also, I want to point out that our defense industries ensure that innovation continues to, eat, to uh, progress. We cannot sustain our position in the world without security, and in order to have that security, we must have continued innovation. Innovation comes from revenue. Our defense industries lead in innovation in spite of everything you read in the press. They do amazing investments with the money that DOD provides them, money they make from international sales. DOD just announced this week that the 2020 budget for the present will probably be flat. It's no surprise. Um, R&D has fortunately not been cut over the years, but remains flat. We need our industries to continue to be vibrant and to reinvest that revenue as they do in research for next generation capability for our forces and for our allied forces to dominate on the battlefield tomorrow. Just a thought. All right, fortunately we're running short on time, so in order to get in a few more questions, I'm gonna recognize a couple of people, ask you both to ask your briefest possible version of your question, let the panel react, and then we'll see if we have time for a few more, but I'll come here and then over here. And so, uh, whoever gets the mic first can. <laughs> <laughs> can go first and then, yeah. So. Cool. Valerie and Sona with Defense News. Um, there wasn't a lot of discussion here today about drone exports, but I was wondering if you could talk specifically about what is in the implementation plan to enable that. Um, and, you know, is, is, can you give us a status update on any changes to the MTCR that the State Department, the U.S., is proposing? I'm sorry, All right. Let, so she asked about changes to MTCR. And then what was the, let's get the second one. And uh, Thanks, Andrew. I'm Will Embry from DynCorp International. Laura, you and Alex both talked about uh, uh, advocacy uh, being reinforced under the new policy. 
Uh, when I was a Foreign Service officer, I advocated for defense sales overseas under a very strict set of rules. Uh, now at uh, Defense Contractor, I feel that we're hamstrung compared to our foreign uh, uh, embassies. Uh, have you issued new guidelines for embassies and, uh, and commercial counselors on what they can do? Sure, we'll start with, uh, Will, with your question on advocacy. We have not yet issued new guidelines. Um, it is a question that we're looking at. What should our role be? I know that uh, Defense Security Cooperation Agency uh, issued um, guidance to their security cooperation officers in our embassies around the world. Uh, because uh, that's another point of confusion. It's, we have our security cooperation officers, we have our foreign service officers, and we have our uh, foreign commercial service uh, and commerce department. So, um, but it is definitely something that we'll be looking at and, uh, and hopefully issuing something as the, as the process goes on. And then who wanted to tackle the MTCR question? Oh, I'm guessing that's you too, Laura. Yes, <laughs> Uh, Ambassador Kane now mentioned in her remarks um, the MTCR that uh, we are um, uh, looking to try to reinvigorate um, the MTCR with respect to uh, UAVs um, and uh, have proposed uh, something to our partners uh, that we are working um, to try to gain acceptance that we hope will um, will uh, open up some market uh, space for our um, for the producers of uh, UASs here in the United States and also um, uh, abroad. But that's something that we're uh, working towards this fall. So I uh, hope to have more later. Just one quick piece on ad the advocacy point. Um, you know, one of we talked about strategic competitions as a larger, you know, geopolitical impetus. I think one of the tools that has been used as part of that competition is advocacy by our, our rivals, um, by our competitors. And when you look, and, and I would say even not just by our competitors as well, even friends and allies. Uh, have, have had a very vigorous advocacy, um, high-level advocacy effort going back, you know, decades. And I think as, as you alluded to, you know, we've, we've uh, in recent times, we have not been as aggressive with high-level advocacy as maybe uh, we could have been. And so I think one of the thoughts behind uh, the larger CAT policy, and I think driven by some of the folks at the highest levels of the administration who personally identify with you know, advocacy as being something they want to undertake, um, is that, that that's a way for us to be strategically competitive is to have that high level advocacy. So as, as state continue, the interagency continue to work on that, that uh, you know, revising the guidelines and working on the implementation.